the word divorce carries everybody's own unique stories and their own unique pain. And you have to hold and validate that you are courageous and brave and in your integrity, and you can be proud of your decision to divorce. From To Be Magnetic, this is The Expanded Podcast with your host, Lacey Phillips. As the leading destination for neural manifestation, we dispel the woo-woo in order to help you create real, tangible results based on neuroplasticity, psychology, epigenetics, and energetics. Our goal is to normalize the practice of manifestation and empower you to get into the driver's seat of your life in order to manifest the experiences, relationships, and things that most align with your authenticity. Part of our manifestation process entails expanding past your limiting subconscious beliefs. Therefore, by tuning into this podcast with interviews from experts, thought leaders, spiritual teachers, scientists, and those with neural manifestation success stories, you're starting the process of expanding your subconscious in order to see to believe that anything you desire is possible. And by pressing play, the process begins. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Expanded. Jessica here. We have another incredible explained for you today, and we have another really powerful guest to join us on our round table. We have Janelle Nelson, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist, as well as an EMDR practitioner. I think you guys are getting the trend that we are very interested in EMDR. She also has certifications in somatic training, breath work, and she specializes in attachment styles and attachment traumas, as well as couples work. She has been doing this work for over a decade and has launched her own practice, the Wholeness Collective Therapy Group, focusing on many of these issues and much, much more. We are excited to have Janelle on our round table. You may have heard her on our process guest, but now we get to see her in the expert position and hear all of her insights we have on the theme today. So this theme is all around divorce. And hold on before you get scared off by the term. When we think of divorce and integrating it in a way, especially with the to be magnetic work, we really want to think about what wounding took place when you're thinking of divorcing, maybe you have already divorced and what you can heal from. And then looking at divorce from the angle of children, whether you were a child of divorce or you have children in divorce. And we really touch on even how to navigate difficulties within relationships, how to navigate co-parenting as these subjects come up and really how we can be the most authentic versions of ourselves, even through very difficult sort of messy things like a subject of divorce and come out the other side, even more resilient and authentic for having gone through it. So whether you are divorced, are thinking about that, are maybe in a relationship and needing help on some of the dynamics you're processing through, or maybe even you are a child of divorce or just want to be prepared and insight and know how to repairing your inner child, there is something in this episode for everyone. We also talk about what sort of things to think about when you are looking for a partner that you want to have children with one day, what sort of things can you check off in your mind, and then even within dynamics, what sort of attachment issues may present, what core wounds present, and how can we start to take accountability and heal through those things even within the relationship before we're ready to exit or even are thinking about exiting. I know you guys are going to love it. It was such a good combo and tons of takeaway. I hope you guys enjoy. And now a word from our partners. As you continue to hear us talking about and partnering with Blue Blocks, they have a couple of products that have really supported this process for me that are extremely accessible, practical, incredible. One of which that I really want to highlight is the Lumi Lamp Sleep Plus. Everybody in here heard me talk about my manifestation of the Lumi Clip Sleep Plus in prior episodes. 
I believe I manifested that because for a couple of years now, I've been saying, if only I could find a clippable reading light that is incandescent. Well, even better than incandescent, because we know that still has flickering issues and a tiny bit of blue light in it, which is very damaging. And of course, Blue Blocks came out with a Lumi Clip Sleep Plus, and that's the red light that helps induce your melatonin and getting you ready for sleep at night so that you can read. Or if you're anything like myself and Max, we journal our gratitude list every single night together. It's our one practice because he gets home late I'm about to go to sleep where we can really connect and get into that really beautiful space of gratitude. Not a manifestation practice, it's just a spiritual practice as a couple. So I literally clip the Lumi Clip Sleep Plus to my To Be Magnetic journal, and I position it in between both of our journals so we can write that out. And what they've launched recently is a step up. It's the Lumi Lamp Sleep Plus. So it's the portable lamp version. So if you're anything like me, I actually place that near me in the bath. If I'm wanting to read or journal at night, you know, I'll usually have a candle going on because I've talked about this a ton, but after dark in our house, it's literally the 17th century. I only have either these Lumi Sleep Plus bulbs, a clip or a lamp, or I have candles burning. I have no blue light emitting anywhere because my hormones are so sensitive. You can listen to prior fertility episodes for that. But the Lumi Lamp Sleep Plus is amazing because you can actually take that around with you and stick it anywhere. So I'll stick it with me next to the bathtub when I'm journaling at night, when I'm just candlelight and I actually need more light to see. Something I love about it too is that Max and I are really manifesting a van, the family van, you know, like the Sprinter built out experience. We've been calling it in for quite some time so that we can start to take all of our puppies and hopefully many of our babies anywhere we want across the U.S., whether it's up to the forest house, whether it's through the national parks. Everybody knows I've been manifesting the house back east. You know, that's the way that we would transition the family and the dogs. But I love that I can take this Lumi Lamp Sleep Plus with me or have the Lumi Clip if I want to read at night, or that I can deck out the van with the Lumi Sleep Plus bulb. So literally put those inside of any actual built-in lamps. So we'll have those linked below. Those are the products I've been obsessed with lately. So if you want to try anything from Blue Blocks at checkout, use the code all caps magnetic, M-A-G-N-E-T-I-C to receive 15% off. I hope you enjoy them as much as I do. So this conversation surrounding beekeepers natural is a little overdue in the sense, did anybody get hit as hard as our household with colds this last season? I don't know if it's because so many of us haven't, you know, we've been isolated from one another and quarantined from one another, or because I have a new baby and it's their new immune system. I have no idea, but it was the roughest cold season of our lives in the sense that there would not be a time that one of us in the house would catch a cold and then it would knock everybody else out like dominoes and all the way down to our co-care person who I think was sick once a month for five months straight. And when you have a business and a baby, it means everything just stops. And it was totally insane. And the only things that helped us recover quickly or helped preventative on the two times I personally didn't get sick when Teddy or somebody else in the house did was this regime. I'm going to tell it to you. So a tea that we would make every single time in our household is a huge steeping pot decoction of ginger. And once that's made, we would then put it in a jar and we would put a spoonful of the bee powered superfood honey in it, which again is so powerful because it has the propolis, the royal jelly and the bee pollen. So it's just literally a medical grade immune supporting super honey is what we'll call it with antioxidants and so many minerals along with some lemon. And once things would turn into a cough, if they did, again, if I wasn't sleeping, it would obviously continue. I would do the Be Better cough syrup, especially the nighttime support was huge because that's when it would come up. You know, it's sort of their take on the more allopathic night cold stuff a lot of us probably took growing up. 
because it has that melatonin support and for restful, deep sleep. That's the only way we can all really recover, right? Is that deep, deep rest, plus the propolis, plus the elderberry. It was so soothing. For daytime support, they have the Be Better cough syrup, which is with chaga. So that's an immune booster on top of the propolis and elderberry. That was our medicine cabinet through this last season. Beyond that, what I do every single day is I take a spoonful of their bee-fueled bee pollen and I put it on top of whatever snack I'm having. May it be coconut yogurt or a piece of toast. I'll put my favorite type of raw almond butter on along with a tablespoon of the bee fueled bee pollen. What I love about their bee pollen, I've talked about it so much, I use it daily, and that's why I can't stop talking about it, is that it's a raw source. So it means that it still has all of the vitamins and minerals totally intact in it. It's super fresh. And for me, I don't take a multivitamin. That is my multivitamin every day is a teaspoon of that. So I swear by it. I did it all through pregnancy and I'm starting to prepare for the next baby. So it's something I do every single day. So today, Beekeepers Naturals is offering you an exclusive offer. You can either go to beekeepersnaturals.com forward slash TBM or enter the code all caps TBM to get 25% off your first order. That's B-E-E-K-E-E-P-E-R-S-N-A-T-U-R-A-L-S.com forward slash TBM or enter the code TBM. All right, on to the episode. We have a really good topic today, even though it kind of invokes a bit of like fear or oh no when you hear this word, but it can actually be a really powerful time and a lot of energetics around it. So we're doing explained divorce and we have on licensed marriage and family therapist and EMDR therapist Janelle with us. So many people asked her from the process where she talked about her divorce, you know, how did you navigate divorce and what do you do during the process? And we get this question a lot at TBN of how to navigate divorce, how to know when it's time for a divorce. And then even on the flip side, you know, 44, I think is the statistic now, percent of marriages in the U.S. end in divorce. So that means there's a lot of kids that are of families of divorce, myself being one of them, or separated parents, Lacey being one of them. So there's a lot of things that you can pull apart and help to heal and integrate coming from this break of a divorce. And it's really interesting because I heard something astrologically recently on someone's podcast that the theme for this month, and maybe it's because the eclipse seasons, but is about breaking, breaking down to break through and like all of this essence of breaking. So the energetic of the break and divorce being one of those can be really, really powerful time. And it needs a little bit of hand holding to to explore it and move through it because it can be some difficult emotions. So welcome, Janelle and Lacey. Thank you. Welcome, Janelle. This is my first amazing podcast episode that we get to speak together on. And we have a very fun announcement coming soon, collaborating with Janelle. But I just want to give the warmest welcome because you were one of my very first clients. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, Amanda Blair, you know, our other coach, you guys were in the very, very beginning. And so it's been so beautiful to watch that arc. I think you were literally in the midst of your Divorce. You were oh, just, yeah. I mean, you were moving out like in exactly. our second session. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this is so kismet and so beautiful. And I just really wanted to welcome you, not only back to the community in an episode, but to the community because you will be on explained episodes with us here and there. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's such an honor to be here. And it is so sweet. It is so sweet for me to feel like, well, you you witnessed it, you know, you witnessed it and honestly held my hand. And you were one of like a huge pillar of support at that time, as you're navigating so much fear and unknown and all of that you and TBM and the work was like such, such a gift to me. So I'm forever grateful. Well, we are so grateful too. (laughs) (laughs) And Janelle, if you want to just give some of your um, expertise and background, that would be super helpful just to remind everyone on that as well. 
Oh, sure. So I am a, a licensed marriage and family therapist and I've been doing, gosh, I've been doing EMDR for maybe 11 years now. And I worked at a drug and alcohol rehab center for many, many years before working in a big agency and then starting my private practice and now in a group practice. But yeah, trauma and codependency are my specialties and then using EMDR. And I also love somatic experiencing as a way, like those are my two favorites as far as like processing trauma which is the TBM work is just could not be more aligned as far as getting to the deep root. And also just what I love about TBM is taking radical responsibility for yourself. And so even as we're talking about divorce today, whether to stay, whether to go, like it all comes down to taking radical responsibility, which is why I just love TBM for that reason. And a tiny, a tiny tangent, which is a little bit off topic, but I think not so much as we go further into all of our work together. You were the person who introduced me to EMDR. Yes. You were the original person who came up from San Diego, gave me a session, and it changed my life. Oh, that's so amazing. And it was so funny, Lacey, because I remember, you know, I had a session with you at your Echo Park home and you were doing the sub, you were basically doing a DI with me. And I remember coming out of it and I'm like, hey, by the way, um, I don't know if you know this, but I do this thing called EMDR and it like kind of matches. Yes. (laughs) I'm like, we should do that sometime. (laughs) Yeah. So everybody stay tuned for all of that, even though we'll hone back into divorce. But I just thought that was a really, really really fun, fun topic. For sure. For sure. So Lacey, I actually want to start off with you on this one. What are the energetics of a divorce? Is this the rock bottom moment? Is this the like, wow, everything is falling apart? How would you pin this in a manifestation standpoint? Well, it's really interesting because I personally have never wanted to touch this before because I do think it is such a big and weighted decision for many, some not so much, but many that I know it involves children, it involves co-ownership of real estate and co-mingled finances. So often in supported, et cetera, I've always not steer cleared. We've answered questions on this, but I really believe that you can certainly categorize energetically, I think, different types of relationship scenarios that are going to go through divorce. However, it does feel individual to me based on everything that goes into it, you know, and and that's why I think I'm so excited to finally touch this topic with you on this episode responsibly. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Because I feel that I can be very energetic focused. And that doesn't always mean the physical and material and emotional of everything that's happening. It's just like, if this happens, this will follow and it equals this. So I think that that will be the beauty of this conversation is weighing in energetically as we touch on different aspects of it, rather than cut and dry. This is the energetic of divorce because it is individual. It really is. And and so for instance, in dating, to me, that's not always tremendously individual. You can categorize things very simply, like that person's emotionally unavailable, that person's an avoidant, that person's et cetera. But it's the beginnings of something, even though a lot can weigh on your heart and a lot can go into a decision of walking away from something. What that's doing, it to me, it's kind of like preventative, right? When we're making decisions energetically and dating, it's really easy to be off the cusp or be black and white, et cetera. But divorce, again, like you touched on Jessica, and that's a part that I feel really, really, really strongly about when children are involved. That it's just mm-hmm. big when animals Absolutely. and children are Absolutely. involved. Absolutely. It's so major of how to navigate this. And it's not a black and white energetic. So that's the sort of disclaimer I want to make. And I'm excited to weigh in as we touch on on different topics of divorce and aspects of it. I love that you say that because I think even when people write into us, they're like, okay, my current you know, husband or wife or partner is doing this, that means there are tests and I should divorce them, right? But like, what about the kids? And it's like, okay, whoa, 
you're framing it through the lens of you just started dating this person and is this person potentially my test? You know, there's so many other factors that you have to think about there. So I love that you said it's not like, okay, they either on my list or they aren't and then they're out. It's there's so many other things at play there before you can just judge it that quickly. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. And I'm so glad that you're naming that because it's really more about what is your individual alignment. And that can look at a million different ways depending on what the situation is. And again, going back to radical responsibility, sometimes it's leaning in to really, really hard things. And sometimes your magnetism is, is in the actual leaving. And so I'm so glad that you named that because it is not black or white. So many marriages are incredibly different and so many divorces are incredibly different and it's just so nuanced for every single person. So I'm so glad that that, that's being named. I couldn't agree more. One topic that has been coming up a lot for me in friend circles and people close to me, especially post having Teddy and being a child of split parents and four different household caretakers growing up that I'm very passionate about on the preventative front that I think we can talk about quite candidly that leads into why many things can end in divorce. Yeah. (laughs) When you're choosing a partner, especially I see this in Los Angeles and New York a lot with friends that are eager to have children, that they may not choose the most responsible partners to do it with. And oftentimes they are settling for a trauma bond. They're settling for, this is who I can get to do this with and I want this. And what what's not being thought about in that scenario, those many scenarios, rather than this partner and I are in each other's highest good at this moment. And we can fast forward a little bit and look at how consciously we will parent together. I'm seeing a lot of people settling in order to have a child, and they're not thinking through, oh, this partner will be the most conscious and highest parent for my child. And that, I think, is is worth a little bit of a conversation that I think will shed a little bit of light. Not that every person getting divorced has children, but to me, that's what's dictating our future and consciousness. And that's something I want to talk about a little bit before we really move into the divorce piece. Because I think many listening could be in this situation or looking for their partner or even looking for their partner to have children with. And I think having this little bit of a preventative, energetic conversation can be really inspiring. Because what I can say, if you do not settle and if you're doing the work, meaning to become the most conscious version of yourself, you will call in your most conscious partner to consciously parent with if that's a desire. Absolutely. So I'll throw the floor over to that, whatever that inspires. I just keep thinking about like, what about the people who are in relation and then they're like, oh shoot, they're like second guessing or maybe they had a kid already and they're like, okay, how do I navigate going forward? Am I just stuck? Like, no, absolutely not. I think you can can move through that relationship but my heart goes out to immediately the people who are like, oh, shoot, I already did that. <laughs> yeah, I feel like, Lacey, what you're naming is people that are still in scarcity and they're trying to control it. And so they're just trying to orchestrate to have this experience and they're not really surrendering and they're not, you know, they're ultimately, again, out of alignment because they're trying to control it. It's like there's the dream of the child and then... And then once they're in it, they're like, oh no, this is a big deal. (laughs) And I'm like, what did I do? Because this is like a nightmare and just deeply, deeply radically impacts that child's life, who you co-parent with. So to the person that wants that baby so bad, they're in scarcity and they're trying to control. I just want to be like, oh, I I get it. And just, I'm so sorry. And like lean in and do the work and your, your partner will come. You know, there's a really deep intimacy when you share a child with someone and whether you're divorced or not, like there just is an intimacy there. So you want that to be as conscious as possible. Do we have a list? I'm thinking through my mind right now because I have one in real time. You know, the person listening to this 
could be like, well, what does that look like? You know, that partner who will co-parent consciously because everyone's stuff comes up once a baby comes into the picture. All of your inner child stuff comes up. I mean, it's just everything comes up. You're, you're short-circuited and you're at each other, et cetera. Is there a little list? I mean, maybe there is even definitively in therapy of what a conscious relationship, marriage, or partnership looks like co-parenting. To me, it's like someone who will really show up, someone who's emotionally available, someone who is secure. Yeah. And I would say someone that wants a child, like they're not just (laughs) number one. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like they really are like, yes, with or without you, this is what I'm looking for too. And this is what I want. And and because I feel like someone like, okay, they're just like people pleasing their partner. And then they get in and they're like, whoa, this is, this is really hard. And this is a lot of work. But the ones that are like, yeah, I'm all in and they're all in. I mean, to me, that's huge is that, again, it's like you're, what do you always say, Lacey? It's just like when you're manifesting as a couple, both people need to be fully, fully on board. And then all of, of course, then like people that are willing and aware that there is constant growth and evolution and work in partnership, we're we're really like transformation buddies. And you can have 20, 30, 40 different marriages to the same person. And so somebody that really understands that and is willing to go through the life, death, life cycle over and over and over with you. And especially, and then you, and when you start parenting, it just catapults it to a whole nother level of, okay, can we go through these rebirths of our partnership over and over and over again together? I think that was a really profound insight I learned when I was kind of exploring what divorce meant when my parents were divorced. Like, okay, what, what does a healthy relationship look like? Like, what is it supposed to feel like? And when I was looking at it, one big piece was that, oh, you can, exactly what you said, Janelle, you can have all these different relationships within the one relationship, the life death of that relationship and and create a new. And, you know, I understood it consciously, but it wasn't until I think being in my relationship with Daniel where I was like, oh, we have moments where we're like, okay, is it in both of our best interests to continue on? And if we do continue on, what does that look like? And okay, are we, you know, do we have the same goal? Do we have the same intention? Yes. All right, cool. Let's move in that direction. And then it becomes a whole new relationship. And then you're like, cool, that was our one problem. We'll never have that again. And then it's like, okay, then something else, you know, and I think, I think it's that in pursuit of both of our highest alignment, regardless of where that leaves you. But then it's also that like, okay, we both have to be working on our own stuff. Mm -hmm, Like mm -hmm. one person can't be tasked with all of the emotional labor for the relationship because both people are, like you said, it's like your transformation partnership. You are constantly moving through things all the time. And it's like, you have to really be clear. Are you willing to continue to look at your stuff throughout the partnership together? Yeah, exactly. And I think if like on an energetic and the way we've certainly always broached the subject when asked the question, that's what it comes down to when the question is, should I get divorced? The way we've always touched it is essentially what you just said, Jessica, is are you both still growing together, putting in the work together, transforming together? Um, Because that's going to decide a lot. What are some ways that someone could start to see oh, I'm not sure I can just picture people at home being like, okay, wait, is my does my relationship check that box? Like my partner's not in therapy or this isn't happening or whatever. What are some ways that people can start to maybe discern doubts that they're having about their relationship or if they're moving toward, if they're in marriage, if they're moving towards divorce? Janelle, from your perspective, what are some things that you might guide people to in sessions on this? Like one of the ones that I had written down was there's a lot of red flags popping up and your intuition is kind of making you alert to them all at once to really look at the issue. Yeah. And then again, because again, it's just so nuanced with every single situation, but obviously if there are, I mean, the easy one is like any abuse or major boundaries being broken where do you need to step in and communicate and lay some serious boundaries down? So, I mean, that's the no-brainer one. But then there's, let's say, so like there's times where it's like you lean in and you need to do your work. And then there's times where 
I'm thinking about my mind's going to attachment styles. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know what? There's a book called How We Love. And it's a very easy attachment read. Like it breaks it down into like avoider, pleaser, uh, vacillator, controller, victim. And I guess I want to start by saying like, to look at what your piece is. So for example, for somebody's magnetism might be for the avoider to start leaning into their feelings and not running. For the pleaser, it's looking at, you know, their magnetism is saying no and looking at their codependency. For the vacillator, they need to look at their emotional regulation and soothing their inner child. For the controller, they're used to forming a secure attachment by controlling another person. They have to surrender and look at their fear and also self-regulate. Or for the victim to take radical responsibility. So this is where all those nuances come in of where do you need to look at where you're avoiding and taking responsibility. So I think in a lot of like any abusive dynamics or boundaries are crossing, a lot of those times I feel like those are kind of more of the pleaser that needs to look at their codependency and they're terrified to set boundaries and they're terrified to speak their truth and they'd rather just run away and hide. Avoider might do this too. So as you step into your work, instead of focusing on your partner, it sorts itself out. It becomes pretty clear <laughs> whether you should stay or go as you do your own work. If you're not controlling them, trying to fix them, doing it for them, I'm thinking in my own marriage for years, I was so focused on fixing him and correcting him. I'm I'm literally an EMDR therapist, you guys, because I was like, he is trauma. How can I help him? I mean, so bad. But it worked out well in the end. But still, you know, like my, my pleaser attachment went to Fix 66 and where I was able to finally take my power back and gain my own magnetism was actually like setting boundaries and speaking up. And, and that was my, my work. Right. And then as I did that, he was like, yeah, I can't meet you. And was so clear where it was like, okay, this is a necessary ending. There's no other way to go in here. And it is clear as day. So it's like, I want to say almost like work with someone to be able to, to see where do you need to lean into? Because I think a lot of times they're like, well, he's abusive in this and this and this way. So I got to go. It's like, hold up, hold up, hold up. You might need to, your work, as you step into setting the boundaries you need to set. And that relationship might die and rebloom. And no boundaries are being crossed and you are aligned and actually way better than you ever have before. And so don't just cut and run. Actually look and, and do your own un unique individual piece and then see where that unfolds and lands. I, I completely agree with this. And I think that this just highlights even deeper what we said in the beginning, like, are you both growing? Are you both doing the work, et cetera? But that's how I always approach our relationship. And I would say, I say we both have things to work out, but I always focus it on me. Right now, when I'm working with Katie, my therapist, I literally, on our first phone call, she's like, what do you want to work on? And I was like, how to be nicer to Max. Like that's when I <laughs> our first phone call because I said, I treat him exactly in the same way I witnessed my mom treating my stepdad and their relationship, which is still the wounds from her father and how he let the whole family down. So it's like everything I'm acting out is just generational at this point. It's not authentic to me. And so that's really where so much of our EMDR and microdosing work lies that I do with her and outside of our sessions. And in exactly as you're saying, and it's it literally is the exact same thing I would say as our boundaries workshop. Before you, you know, verbalize to set the boundary, before you draw the line in the sand. Did you do the subconscious work? Did you clean up your side of the street? Not that it happens quickly and overnight and et cetera, but are you doing that? Because to me, I love the opportunity to lean into tension. As I know, more magnetisms on the other side. And just as you're saying, Janelle, once you've done it, energetically, you're going to feel the shift, the relationship, there's, it's energy, there's, it has to shift, you know, if yeah. one's growing, you know, we can even say spiritually, for lack of a better word, vibrationally, and stepping into their authenticity, it's the invitation, the openness, the gap is there for the other person to do it. And always Max joins in. Like, that's how I know we are still meant to be together at this moment, even though we're not traditionally married. 
we also have a running joke since having Teddy that we both joke with each other. We're like, if you leave, I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> That's really where we're at right now. <laughs> we show each other our darkest post having a yeah. baby because it set that that standard for us that it's like we want to provide this experience as long as it's healthy and conscious of a family, you know? And so not that that is a reason for anybody to ever do it, but I really, really just want to reiterate what you said exactly in that second bullet point, that those are the energetics of manifestation. It will become very clear. And before you really set those boundaries, are you leaning into your own work and, you know, doing the unconscious work? So when it comes to partnership too, and you touch on it with the attachment wound and even codependency, where else can people look how they are showing up? Because I think sometimes they're like, I'm showing up great. And then when they're thinking of doing their own work, they're reprogramming a dynamic with a, a friend and they're not necessarily looking at exactly how they're showing up in the relationship. So their attachment type and how they're presenting there and what wounds could be there is one place to look. Yeah. For the people that maybe don't know a ton about EMDR. So basically when we go through trauma, our brain always, always, always pairs it with a negative belief about ourselves. And there's a saying that like we see the world through rose colored glasses. We don't, we see through whatever lens of our trauma belief. So if we picked up that we're not good enough or we're not lovable or I'm a bad person or I can't trust anyone, whatever our core trauma wounds, that negative belief we see through out of that lens. And then I would say that we all have like a primary core narrative, like a storyline. And usually that wound is more attachment-based wound. You know, let's say if you're parent was a workaholic and there's thousands of instances where you felt neglected or you picked up, I'm not important or I'm not good enough or I'm not lovable. And then you, you see through that lens. So your partner will always, <laughs> without exception, tap into <laughs> your worst wound. And a lot of times when there's high conflict, it's like basically like them, how they show up or don't show up, they're tapping into your core narrative and you are so you're reacting and you're fighting because you're like, they're validating that total belief, that shadow you have that you're not good enough or you're not important or you're not lovable. And then that's all the reactivity around it. I love, love, love your guys' trigger DI because that's the, it's actually, it's an EMDR technique called the float back technique. Take it, any current conflict that you, you know, recently had, take it through the trigger DI, get to the root. And I would say that that can kind of help a little bit to connect to maybe give you some clues to what your core narrative may be. And what happens is when you really, really, really deeply deal with your core narrative, no one can ever hook into you anymore. That's when you can actually see your partner clearly when you've dealt with your core trigger. So your trigger basically is just, it's, it's self-awareness to go, oh, they're hooking into something that I could say, no, I know I'm good enough. It's like, well, clearly if you're triggered, there's some part of you that doesn't think you're good enough. And so when you deal with that and then it's like, oh no, I, I know I'm good enough. So like, huh, what's going on with them? You're kind of out of your own space and you can look at your partner objectively really for the first time and see them, see them clear. Just go, oh, okay, something's happening with them that they're showing up this way or doing this thing. And you're now secure and whole within yourself. So then you can go in very peacefully to say, hey, you showed up this way and I'm curious to why. And this is how it made me feel. But like, what's going on with you instead of attacking? Right there, it's like, again, their relationship might heal and repair and go into another life cycle, or it's it's navigating and ending and co-parenting where you're not constantly triggered and there can be ease and there can be a very clear energy without so much animosity between your co-parent because you can just see them for the, you know, their broken inner child and still have your own boundaries, but you're not it's not charged anymore because you've, yes, exactly. I totally, I, I love that. I love that so much. I, I wish for all of us to 
to lean into that and do that work for the sake of like children in general. Mm -hmm. I have, I have an example that might be helpful. I'm definitely like outing my shadow on wanting to share this right now, but I'm like, oh, it'll help. So one, one of my core primary narratives is like not good enough. Like I have to do all these things to be seen and heard or whatever. And my dynamic that I witness is kind of the one that you were touching on, Janelle, which is like my dad was a workaholic, came home, was exhausted. And I was like, play with me, play with me, play with me. And he was like, I want to sit down and chill. And so what I took away from that, even though he wasn't doing anything wrong, what I took away from that is like, oh, if I was more special or more fun or more important, then he would want to play with me, which is completely false. But that's what my child brain took away. So in my relationship, my partner has ADHD and one of his things is like he can only focus on one thing at a time. And as much as he tries to multitask and listen to multiple things at once, he he gets very distracted and he'll be able to like recite back what I said without actually listening. And so when my trauma comes up, he might ignore me, not because I'm not interesting or not special or not important enough, but because his brain just doesn't work that way. And he doesn't know how to say, hey, I'm so sorry, I can't listen right now. You know, setting his own needs and boundaries. He's trying to people please me. And I take that as, oh, hitting my core wound. I'm not important. Look, it's true. This fear I've had my whole life, it's true. And so I'll have to go in, do my own work, and then realize, oh, wait a second, I'm projecting my core narrative onto his actions when his actions are actually his inability to set a boundary when he can (laughs) hear and not hear what's going on. So it's like you're seen through the lens of the trauma, but then you have to be like, okay, cool. If I don't see it through that lens and I don't believe that narrative's true, how would I see the situation? And what do I need to communicate to them? So hopefully that helps anyone. <laughs> that was that was so perfect, Jessica. That's like such a perfect example and such a testament to the work you've done. You lined it out perfectly. Yeah. And it sounds like, I mean, that you can be that objective and see it for what it is. That's it. And yeah, that was perfect. Thank you for being vulnerable about it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I'm like, ah. (laughs) But it's hard. And I think think people need to understand, like sometimes we feel like, no, they're being a bad partner and they're doing this. It's like, okay, well, what am I also bringing to the story? That may be true. And maybe I do need to voice my needs and be like, hey, if you can't listen, I need you to say so. But also, how do I look at this through my core narrative and what I'm trying to confirm to myself, even though I don't want to. Yeah, that was so perfect. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, that's exactly it. So I'm quickly interrupting this episode to invite you if you're ready to start your manifestation journey, or if anything you've heard in our manifestation episodes has piqued your interest to begin. We have a la carte workshops in everything from the basics bundle, which is what we recommend to everyone who starts. It's the formula that actually teaches you how to manifest, unblocked inner child, and unblocked shadow. We also have a la carte workshops on love and money. But the real gem is the Pathway membership because it encompasses every single workshop we have. It's a year-long membership with full access to the few a la carte offerings we have and exclusive workshops not available anywhere else, such as the daily practice, which is what everybody in the Pathway uses, hopefully at least three times a week to daily in order to truly create the new neural pathways that one needs in order to manifest and houses the library of our deep imaginings, which is our unique hypnosis process that allows you to get into your subconscious and overwrite those old neural pathways, creating the new ones. You can use our special code EXPANDED, all caps, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D, to receive $20 off your first a la carte workshop purchase or $20 off your first month of the pathway. Again, that's all caps, EXPANDED, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D. Okay, now back to the episode. (laughs) 
what other ways, and we kind of touched on it in that inner child episode, Lacey, but what other ways can people start to look at what they witness in childhood that might be popping up when they feel like they're on the brink of divorce? I feel like I I really want to defer this to you, Janelle, because I feel like we all kind of know the answer to that question based on everything we've been talking about. Just as you highlighted some wonderful insight on attachment styles and core narratives, what comes up for you in more of a therapeutic terminology of things we can look at and understand when we're at that edge? Because from the energetic standpoint, I'm like, cool. So what I'm hearing in this episode (laughs) is like the same thing over and over. It's like, do your own work, step up. You know, when you're triggered, do your work. And if you hit a point where your partner just abs, it's so clear that they can't meet you there. Now you kind of have that moment where it's like, oh shit, are they open to where we can go, you know, work with somebody together if that's not going anywhere? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's like, it seems like step one is really, really looking at ourselves, like turning the mirror back around. So when you've reached that point where you're like, shit, it only feels like divorce, you know, is there anything else through the therapeutic lens that we can look at and do or filter that question through? Do I get divorced? I mean, I feel like we honestly, we like, we covered it. It's instead of focusing on them, focus on you. You know, like when we say do the work, it's like, yes, it's all inner child. What what are they activating? Healing that, getting your support, doing then your follow-up, like the actionable steps of maybe it's setting boundaries or maybe it's whatever. And or maybe you have like a ping, let's try couples counseling and let's do this. And let's, you know, they, there might be still like a, a boundary you have to set. For me, with my ex, it was like, okay, I don't expect you to be perfect, but I need you to be in process. And so we got to a point where, you know, we were in couples counseling for the last couple years and we, our relationship was literally in the best place it had ever been when we got divorced, like the irony of that, right? But yeah. And, and so even if you think you got to go, it's like, you know, if you have a child, you're going to be in relationship. So how do you make that relationship the best possible? So even if you know you're getting divorced, like go to therapy so it can be as smooth and easy transition because the energy between you will get funneled down to your child. So I think it's really important for a child to know that they are safe and to love their other parent, that there's permission to love their dad. You know, there's no like, they feel like they're betraying you by loving the other parent. Like sometimes there's a rupture and it's so brutal, but when there, when there's a possibility to have a smooth landing, it sets you up to transition the family into a different space with so much ease and it's so gentle. And I mean, I remember even for the first several years, we'd always do an annual Yosemite camping trip. We love it there. And for several years after we divorced, we'd still go and we'd have separate tents and we do our thing. And it was really important for, especially in those early transition years to make sure that we were still doing things together and that there was ease and a friendship and laughter. And we were laughing at things and we have our own family jokes still. So that there's still like, hey, we are, gosh, we are your biggest fans and we adore you and we are going to do whatever we can to make this the most loving, supportive environment for you. And so I think, we know, when you deal with your core inner child and you do the work of a gentle transition, it sets you up to have it not be this like jarring trauma with so much conflict and disassociation and stress, which is, again, just more motivation to do your own work so you can get to the point where you're not, you're not reactive to your partner and the triggers that they present. There is one offshoot, and maybe this is an entire episode in itself, but I have seen this come up. Like when I used to work with people, I see it and support it sometimes in the past. And And I've seen it even with people in community. What about when you're tempted out of divorce by other things? Something that I see to be one of the biggest are what people like to call twin flames, trauma bonds. They're literally, they are literally the quintessential trauma bond. One we're witnessing, I think, in real time at this moment. And people are being called to like go into one camp or the other is the Amber Heard and 
and uh, Johnny oh, Depp yeah. trial. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. <It's laughs> like, if you looked up a trauma bond, literally in the dictionary, oh. like <laughs> she is his mom incarnate, right? <laughs> or like vice versa. <laughs> but I see this sometimes where people are saying, you know, it'll be the first highlight in the relationship that. Um, like sexually, they're not satisfied anymore because they've met somebody that it's like that instant connection and that that thing. And, you know, whenever I've had people reach out about this or whatever, I'm like, I understand that. But if you look at it, and this is from a total manifestation energetic standpoint, this is literally you've been calling in something and the universe is like, here's your perfect mirror from somebody who is going to most likely reflect some really big wound inside of you that's needing. And people will confuse that often. Not to say that everyone you meet outside of marriage is this instance, but but when you are experiencing like, should I have that affair? Wow, this is highlighting the things I don't have or or whatever. How do you usually navigate that through the lens of therapy? Rule number one, stay in your integrity. Always, same, always, same. always. I mean, it it can just get so messy, not even just like the shame then that you will have to process, like your own pain. I mean, I've seen couples with affairs where I'm like, they don't trust each other because they started out of that space. And it's just, it gets just, just so hairy to navigate. So to me, it's like, okay, if that person's coming and they're triggering your trauma bond to me, it's like, I mean, I'm assuming, Lacey, you'd say that, you know, the magnetism is to always stay in your integrity. Always. Yeah, always. right? Yeah. And so it's like, okay, take that to some, you know, grounding and self-regulation and to be able, and then probably grief of like, oh, there's this unmet need that's happening and I want it met. And looking at that, what's, what is that unmet need that's happening within you? And it's almost like crying, like I don't get the whatever that I want and I want it. And again, there's a core wound there. So exploring that and because it's maybe that your tri- your partner's triggering the I'm not lovable or whatever. And then this person's like flooding you with that. And so you're just running to like a human pacifier, right? And it ends up so, uh, so painful. Not again, not just for you, for the person that's in it. And for everyone around, it just it gets so messy. Yeah, I think that's something that's worth touching on. And just from a manifestation standpoint, even if whatever the trigger is or the inspiration is that's coming at you, they're just an invitation while you're in relationship, period. And if you do stay in integrity and you do do the work and you do realize at the end of that, your partner can't meet you, then in integrity, it's uncoupling and starting that situation. All like period, always. And the universe is literally not only inviting you to look at your biggest core wound because that's what it's mirroring in those situations. So not only is it this invitation, the universe is like, what you've been calling in is greater than where you are in self-worth. So get there, you know, and pass these tests. But also on top of that, when we use anything outside of ourselves to fill us up, what we are communicating so clearly to the universe is I'm not worthy enough. I don't have that inside of me. I'm not in my worth. So from a manifestation standpoint, always, 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 no matter how hard it is. And the more polarity of the trauma bond, the harder it will be to resist and to turn inward and to really do that work that's being invited. One thing kind of piggybacking off of that too, like, so Janelle, from your example of how you navigated divorce, you went in, you did the inner work, you came back to your partner saying, okay, look, I looked at my stuff. Now I need you to be in pursuit of growth with me, be in progress, not perfection. You went through and did the work together and eventually came to the conclusion, okay, we both are not getting our needs met. We both tried to make it work. We put in a valiant effort. Maybe our communication's really good. Our relationship is at a very good respect level. But what we need for a romantic relationship, it's not here anymore, decide to separate What about when the other person isn't willing to put in the work and you do have to make that that break and then it gets really messy, especially if you have kids? How do you consciously uncouple when you're the only one consciously uncoupling? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. It's still the same piece. How does this person trigger your core wound so you're not reactive, so you can hold space for them and self-regulate where you don't need their validation anymore? You don't need them to agree on the ending of the why or any of that, you can hold and validate and self-regulate and and recognizing that person's limitation and recognizing their capacity. You want them to be a gallon and the reality is they are a pint. And grieving that and then coming to acceptance of, okay, the reality is this person isn't able to meet me in the way I need. And then you can adjust your expectation and still have ease and still have peace without fawning, without being codependent. You're recognizing their their capacity and their level. And I also will say too, for the person that's maybe navigating divorce with a narcissist or somebody really abusive or some somewhere, I mean, that's a whole nother very, very, very tricky thing to navigate. And I'm so sorry. This is so random. I'm just going to throw this out there. But there's there's a girl I follow on Instagram recently called the self-love method. And she does such really like nails it on her content regarding narcissistic relationships and abuse and all of that. That's really solid. I also love a book called The Wizard of Oz, Another Narcissist I Knew. (laughs) The hilarious title. Really, really, really good. But that is a whole nother ball game when there's that at play. And I would say in those relationships, you cannot co-parent. You know, co-parenting is not possible. You are doing what's called parallel parenting, which means that you have your house and they have theirs. And co-parenting is not, unfortunately, not possible. And so that's a, a lot more tricky dynamic. You know, it's so hard because it's still, you still don't ever want to talk bad about your ex in front of a child. The reason why why we don't talk bad about our ex in front of our child is because a child, they're not consciously thinking this, but they are half of that person that you don't like or hate. And so when you're talking bad about your ex, they internalize all of that you know, that that's them. So they're internalizing. There's a part of them. There's half of them that is bad or not, whatever, all the things. And so you're not just talking about your ex, you're, you're what's what you're, the messages that that child's internalizing. So you're literally creating shadow in the child in real time. A hundred percent. Exactly. And so that's why that is a hard no-no. And what I will say, what's tricky when the parent is abusive or narcissistic is you don't want to just talk, oh, your dad's so great. The first of all, I think <laughs> children can kind of see through the, the yeah. BS. Yeah. And then two, what I would say to that is there's a difference of not talking bad about your ex, but also validating that child's reality. So you want to say if they go, yeah, daddy was angry and oh, that's so hard that daddy's angry and it's so hard that what's going, you know, and you create space for them to share where they're sharing their experience and you're holding it and you're validating without bashing that person and talking bad about that person. You're you're holding space for validating their reality because you don't want to then gaslight them like, oh, he's great when they're experiencing something like, no, he's actually a nightmare. So that's like a kind of a little bit more tricky to hold, but I think there's a way to do it where you, you know, again, remain in your integrity and you're not talking bad and you're also validating their reality. Some tools I've heard on that, is this correct, Janelle, where it's like you, you're able to ask questions, not to like get intel, but to say, how does that make you feel? Oh, when that happened, what did you think? What did you feel? And then it's like, oh, that must be so hard. That feels really painful when those things happen. So it's like not giving any of your judgment, not giving any of your opinions, but also allowing them to express and then validate. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly it. And I would say too, you know, I love play therapy. And if you are a mom listening that wants to put your child in therapy, find a very specialized child only play therapist that has certification in play therapy because it's such a specific modality where they're playing with puppets or different things. Your child is working through the stress of whatever parent or the situation without naming this is my mom or dad, whatever. So they're working through their emotions and that therapist is working with them on how to set boundaries or how to be in their authenticity without naming who they're talking about. So it's a total beautiful art form (laughs) that I have so much respect for. 
versus like being an adult and we're actually naming the people and talking about it. This is kind of this like underground way where I, I've just seen uh, just children just like come alive and thrive after they've had their own space. You know, again, their therapist is working with them in ways that they don't, they don't even understand what's happening. So like for parents who are navigating that have kids and then even for kids now adults that have witnessed this and maybe they didn't get this sort of like conscious uncoupling, really what the kid needs out of the situation is to reinforce if you're not in an abusive narcissistic dynamic that you're still a family unit, your love for the kid hasn't changed, it's not their fault, reinforce how lovable they are, make sure not to speak badly of the partner in front of the children, and then look to a therapist if possible for you and your partner to go so you know what to say and how to speak and hold space for your child, but then also for your child to have therapy to process their sadness, grief, anger, et cetera. Yeah. The one thing I'm thinking that I've seen that I have seen before is where they don't mean to, but you know, as you're navigating your own grief and trauma, I've seen dynamics, especially with highly sensitive kids, where they end up being the caretaker for the parent, which is a big no-no because that's the parentified child. And that child essentially is seeing their parent experience their trauma and their big emotions. And so they're trying to manage that that parents, okay, I need to make my parent be okay so then that they can then be there for me. So it's so backwards. It's so and big. that oh my gosh, it's so like that's codependency developing at its finest. And a measurement. So, oh, completely. Yeah, completely. So you need your own support system. You need your own therapist, coach, friends. Like this is yours to carry and you're helping your child carries their pain and they're not at all to carry yours. You're there to hold space for them, not for them to do for you. And then a really sweet empath, sensitive child is going to want to do that. And that's where you go, you are so sensitive and you are so sweet. And I love that, you know, and mirror back to them how sweet it is, but then you, but you're taking care of yourself. They're not to, to support you. And what I love about all these things that you're kind of laying out here is like the ideal situation, right? So if someone's like, okay, my parents divorced and I didn't receive that, when you're doing reprogramming work, envision parents that did. What would it have felt like if they did do that? What would it have felt like if you felt secure and stable through that and start to kind of tap in and build that neural architecture and those pathways of support, security, safety, even if you didn't have it, because no one's perfect and people are just doing the best they can. And many resources that are available today weren't when your parents were getting <laughs> Oh, yeah, completely. (laughs) So it's kind of your responsibility at this point to patch all that up a little bit or, you know, at least, you know, desensitize the limiting beliefs and negative beliefs around, around those experiences. And I think what comes up for me is why I, I bring up the aspect of children. Many people listening who are, maybe going to navigate divorce or who have recently got divorced, et cetera, might not even have children. But remember that everyone around you in your community is affected when you're getting divorced because <laughs> similarly, they have to hear about, you know, all of the the aspects of it. But the other piece that I wanted to touch on a little bit that you may have a snapshot of, because this could be a whole podcast in itself as well, when you're seeing people coupling coming together, what are things to look out for, to work on preventatively that you could see most often than not will end up in divorce? Because we heard that statistic at the beginning. It's literally almost half of marriages will end up in divorce. What are some of those red flags that you see in your practice that had they have looked at this or considered this or tried this, maybe A, they wouldn't be with this person or B, these people may have not ended up in divorce? Yeah, that's such a good question. I mean, I think we all come together at the level of consciousness that we're at. I see, you know, over and over, it's like the idea of somebody completing them or they have their own hole and this person's going to come and fill that up and make me feel good about myself. It's like, no, like (laughs) we're each responsible for our happiness. So I think if you come into it with, it's my job to love me. It's my job to 
for you to be your own whole person and this person is just coming alongside on your journey versus them completing you in any way. It's like that feels like where the breakdown happens because then there's an inevitable breakdown when you come into that with that person's just there to, to meet that need. Well, what I'm hearing you say is anybody listening to this, it's, it's really everything we've talked about in the whole episode. If you find yourself newly in relationship, the new possibility of deeper commitment in this way, the real piece here is to look at every aspect inside yourself and ask yourself, is there anything about this relationship I'm looking to fill me up or complete me? But am I needing any aspect of this to complete me because I need to go take some time and look at all of that to see how I can complete it myself and get those needs met myself in order to walk into this autonomously? So it's like two autonomous people coming together to co-create not meaning the children, et cetera, but to co-create that kundalini, like the love, the connection, the experiences with each other, supporting each other, you know, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And one thing I want to say too, is that, yeah, we want healthy love and healthy attachment. And that's, and we, as humans, like yearn for that. There's a quote that I love that says, we're hurt in relationship and that we're healed in relationship. And so when we've done enough of our own healing, I think that's when a healing relationship can enter the picture. And those are just so, oh my gosh, so profound to have. So I'm like for the person that is navigating divorce right now and they're so hurt and they're just like, yeah, right. I don't want to touch a relationship with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> like, there's no way, you know, and they're still in their trauma. It's like, yeah, you're used to relationships being so not life-giving. And there's the idea of like, there's a relationship can be like a power source or a drain. And I've certainly been there where it's like, oh, this is just draining and taking everything out of me. There's nothing life-giving about it. And then it's like, yeah, after there's healing, it's like, yeah, you can attract in that healing relationship, which is just magical. And literally, as they're that power source relationship, then you have space for everything else in your life, your your work and your career. It's just so life-giving that it's like, it just adds to your own purpose and what you're, what you're doing in life. Hold out for that. Because that, that is possible and that exists in someone that can be your transformation buddy over and over and over again. That's magic of like real, deep, incredible love that is possible for you. Amen. <laughs> One thing, just not to go back to the heavier stuff again. <laughs> hit you us, know, Jessica, hit us. <laughs> the Gottmans, who are like the number yeah. one researcher on divorce, have yeah. they call it their four horsemen. And they are like the four things that really predict divorce. And the idea with these four things is that they're not like, a, oh, if you do them once or a couple of times, you're going to get divorced. It's if you have a pattern that this is the norm in your relationship, you're more likely to get divorced. So just playing this out, we'll link this article in the show notes. Number one is criticism. Very different than a complaint. A complaint is like, I'm scared you were running late and didn't call me. I thought we agreed to do that. Criticism is you never think about how your behavior is affecting other. You're so forgetful. You're so selfish. You never think of me. So if criticism is the way that you communicate, that's a big predictor. The second one is contempt. It's really attacking the character of the other person. They actually say that contempt is the single greatest predictor of divorce and needs to be eliminated when it comes up. So if someone says something where it's beyond a criticism, it attacks the partner's character and it puts them in a position of moral superiority. Oh, you're tired, cry me a river. I've been with the kids all day, running around like mad, keeping this house going. Like, what are you doing? Just sitting on the couch doing nothing, you're pathetic. So when you have these really intense sort of like verbal attacks on someone, that's a big indicator. Okay, we need to go into couples mm -hmm. counseling. We need to go look at this because that's not sustainable for a long-term relationship. The third is defensiveness. So responding to everything as if your partner is attacking you, like if a partner says, uh, did you call Betty and Ralph this morning to let them know we're not coming? <laughs> These are the examples from the article. I know. Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> the Betty defensive and Ralph. response would be like, you know how busy I am. Why didn't you do it? 
So it's immediately thinking your partner's out to get you, thinking that maybe a benign question is an attack on the reverse that kind of says something to how the dynamic has been. And then the last one is stonewalling. So that's when the listener withdraws, shut down, and simply stops responding to their partner. It means they're flooded psychologically, and they really just don't even want to look at the problems anymore. They kind of start putting up that avoidance boundary and and don't uh, want to repair. So if any of these things are a habitual pattern of behavior, that's a good sign that the relationship's not going very well, and it's time to really take a look at how you both can start to work together better and if it's the right relationship for you. Yeah, I love their work and that's so perfect. One more thought I'm having is to the person that is going through that necessary ending, there is so much shame around the word divorce. Like, Oh, that was something I wanted to talk about. Yeah, taking the stigma of divorce out. Yes, and that one was for me, it was like, when you come to the place where, I mean, for me, for my partner it was like, yeah, I can't heal through this. And then that would have meant I would have been in an abusive relationship. Even though we were in a great place, like I would have been in an abusive relationship if I had stayed in that marriage. And so it was a necessary ending. And for me and someone maybe that was like similar in that situation, I want to say like, hold your head up high. This is a sacred initiation for you. Your new version of self is being reborn and you can hold your head up high. You don't need to wear any shame badge. People are going to project onto you because the word divorce carries everybody's own unique stories and their own unique pain. And so they're going to project onto you and you have to hold and validate that you are courageous and brave and in your integrity. And there's no shame that you need to carry that does not belong to you. And you can be proud of your decision to divorce. Lacey, I don't know if you remember this, but like I kept my wedding ring on for like a year Mm -hmm. and you were like, you called me out. You were like, uh, so I see that that's still on. And I was like, "Uh uh-huh. Yep. So it is. I remember your, your biggest fear at the time, you know, and you shared a lot of this in your episode was how you would feel like a failure as a licensed marriage and family therapist, if your clients knew, and that was so scary. And and it was such a, an incredible opportunity for growth there. Just so, so, such an incredible opportunity. Totally. I mean, here I am, like literally my title is like licensed marriage and family <laughs> therapist. And I'm like, oh God, like it couldn't have been more like perfect to my own shadow. But what's so interesting is when I went through that divorce, like my practice just boomed. Like yeah. I was able to see and hold marriage and relationships in a whole huge new container. And I felt like I was like the speakeasy therapist for women in abusive relationships that needed help navigating it. I was just like one after the other, after the other, after the other. And it was like my perfect aligned client coming through. And cause you can only take someone as far as you've gone. And so as a therapist, which is that huge motivator to keep going and keep doing your own work so that you can then help people then na- navigate. And so it's so funny, but what was my biggest shame is now like... Your greatest success. <laughs> totally. It's so beautiful. <laughs> totally. And, and, and isn't that how things go, you know? Mm-hmm. The other piece that this is the Aquarian in me and probably there's some of my inner child stuff of why Max and I aren't even married, but just the stigma around the word divorce in general. And like you said, everybody carries their own story and association with that. May it be religion or familial or whatever, but imagine how you would react as an individual to someone saying, oh, I'm breaking up with my boyfriend or my partner versus I'm getting divorced from my husband or my partner or my you know, wife or whatever. Just sitting with that a little bit, that the context is exactly the same. <laughs> totally. <laughs> mm-hmm. But we have so much weight in that. And so that's another invitation for someone is to really look at the shadow around the word divorce, period. And that's not to take away from the sacredness of, of marriage or any of that. But at the end of the day, it's 
two people coming together and, you know, at some point, whether consciously or unconsciously, deciding to no longer be together, you know, and and just allowing that stigma to drop a little bit. Oh, that's so good to name, Lacey, because, yeah, you hear the word breakup and your heart goes, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, a, you know, like you You're see like, a puppy yes, yes. and your heart just is like <laughs> opens up and you want to like hug the person and then you hear the word divorce and you're like, like failure. Uh, yeah, yeah, what's totally. going on there? Exactly. You know? And it's from exactly. media. It's all yes. this stuff. And it's, You're absolutely right. It's just like humanizing and, and taking the stigma out of, out of the word divorce. A hundred percent. It's not the 70s anymore, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, and for the TBM member, it's like, yeah, that shame, that's low self-worth energy. So it's like when you can really digest that word divorce and come out of shame and be proud of, you know, leaving a relationship that you did all your work in and is, was not aligned or a necessary end of or abusive relationship, like be proud of that. Be proud of that. So keep going to digest that so that you can be so solid in your worth and hold your head up high and be proud of who you are and what you've gone through and what you've overcome. One other thing too, like if you decide to go through the divorce process and you have kids, knowing that you can create a more aligned, authentic version of yourself that isn't in that relationship anymore, just being that aligned example for your kid is going to be so, so powerful. I think the only reason why I was like hyped to do this episode, I think it's a very important episode, but you know, when we talked about it, Jessica, I was like, all I care about in this world is a magnetic kid. Like that's really at the end of the day, all I care about, you know, and eventually I imagine we'll have workshops and work on that. But at the end of the day, not everybody who comes together in relationship desires or has children, but we are all wounded children, you know, and it's mm -hmm. like, how can we as a brand, you know, help create more magnetic children than wounded children? Because that's really what will heal the future and all the conflict we see. You know, there's a statistic that says when a child has parents that stay together in a high conflict home, they are so much worse mentally than if you were to have divorced. And I've had so many clients that have so much trauma because their parents stayed together and they've metabolized years of high conflict and that the health of that child would have been so far better if they had divorced. And so again, it, it's not whether you're together or not. It's just the quality of that connection and what's being funneled down to that's the predictor of less trauma and stress on that child. But I couldn't agree with you more, Lacey, as far as like moving consciousness forward is like, well, how can we be the most healed and conscious for our evolution? Yeah, I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more with that. But that's something to look at that false narrative of, oh, if we, if we just stay, that's what's best for the child. It's like, no, no, it's not. <laughs> Well, yeah. Would you say the ultimate surmise here is do your work? Like yeah. no matter what, yeah. like yeah. in the beginning stages, middle, if you feel like you're nearing the end, it's really look at your, your core narrative, your wounds, look at your side of the street, take accountability and do everything within your power and don't settle if those needs aren't being met after that. So I think that's like the real, real surmise here, whether you're single calling in, if you're in relationship, if you're nearing the end, it's like the real, real big takeaway. Yeah, exactly. And if you're calling in partnership and come from a family dynamic, whether that was divorce or parents stayed together and there was conflict, looking at that too, what did you actually need in that situation of reprogramming thing? Just like I said, for you could reprogram your parents' divorce, but you could also maybe reprogram if you came from a home of conflict, maybe your parents did separate and they were much happier as independent beings. Whatever you need to see that it's possible to feel safe and loved and worthy going forward. And just know any of your needs that weren't met in childhood, 
like you're saying, may it have been your parents stayed together or they separated, you're only going to want to work out with your partner. (laughs) All of those needs are going to be at the forefront of your relationship until you begin to integrate, desensitize, and heal them. So this episode is applicable to every single one of us who ever want to be in relationship with another human being or other human beings. Yep. So good. Thank you both so much. This is really powerful. And I'm sure one that people are going to continue to come back and listen to time and time again. So thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah. Thank you so much. And we'll see you guys next week. Bye. 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 Thank you so much for tuning into the episode, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, we did. And in case you're not totally ready to join the pathway yet, I wanted to share a few of our free offerings that I'll often suggest to people as a little bit of a blueprint to get them started on their manifestation journey. The first place I like to direct people completely for free is the motivation. You can see it linked below or on our homepage as our testimony library. And it's categorized by different subjects, whether you're calling in career, money, love, wellness, and much more. When you're reading about a member's experience of what they manifested, you're actually seeing to believe and showing your subconscious that that very thing is possible for you. The second place I like to direct people is to the free clarity exercise, which is also linked below. In it, you get to try our own unique hypnosis process, learn about the science and some journaling prompts. And the best part about this, you'll get a tiny taste of what it's like to go into your hypnotic state, bring your subconscious forward and create new neural pathways while receiving clarity. And the third thing, if you haven't listened to it on this podcast yet, please go back to the episode titled Manifestation 101, where you'll learn the basics of neural manifestation to truly understand this process. So go ahead and check out those free resources, the motivation, the free clarity exercise, and the episode Manifestation 101, all linked below. And in an effort to make sure to have representation in this process series, go ahead and submit any process testimonials you have, especially to our LGBTQ plus community, our BIPOC, as well as the Ys, which is anyone in the community who is 45 and over. All right, we'll be back next week.